Is that better? Sorry about that. Could you hear me when I said all that? <laughs> I'm not going to start over. Uh, the forum is sponsored by the National Academy of Social Insurance, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization made up of the nation's leading experts on social insurance. NACI's mission is to advance solutions to challenges facing the nation by increasing public understanding of how social insurance contributes to economic security. The Social Security Disability Insurance Program currently provides income support to more than 9 million people with disabilities and their family members, a total of more than $9.5 billion in benefits monthly. The number of people receiving benefits has increased significantly over the past several decades. 6.5 million people received benefits as recently as 2005, and in 1995, the number was only 4.2 million. The Disability Insurance Trust Fund is projected to be exhausted in the near future, as soon as 2016, according to CBO, and 2018, according to the 2011 Social Security Trustees Report. Journalists, researchers, and Congress have focused a great deal of attention on the growth in the number of SSDI beneficiaries. A number of questions have been raised about the program. Does the growth reflect demographic trends and changes, or is the growth due to SSDI program rules and policies? What is the role of the recession in the growth of SSDI? Is SSDI becoming the new unemployment insurance? Is SSDI fundamentally sound and sustainable in its current form, or does it need changes to ensure its long-term viability? Can these changes be small, or does long-term solvency require radical change? Does SSDI discourage work? Could more be done to encourage people to stay at work when they become disabled? Or could more be done to encourage beneficiaries to return to work after receiving SSDI benefits? A variety of reforms have been proposed. Some propose augmenting SSDI to provide more assistance aimed at keeping people at work or returning to work. Others have suggested creating another public disability insurance program, which would be offered to people with a disability but significant capacity to work, requiring employers to purchase private disability insurance to keep workers employed is another idea that's been suggested. Other proposals seek to completely change the way that disability benefits are designed and provided. This forum will explore why the number of people receiving SSDI has grown, whether that growth will continue, and the implications of the growth for program design. This will include discussion of some proposals for reform and reactions from members of the disability community to the presentations and the proposals. First, we're going to hear from three outstanding speakers. Steve Goss, who is the Chief Actuary of the Social Security Administration, Lisa Ekman, who is Senior Policy Advisor at Health and Disability Advocates, and Dave Stapleton, Director of the Center for Studying Disability Policy at Mathematica Policy Research. Next, we'll hear brief responses to the presentations from Marty Ford, Director of the Public Policy Office at the Ark of the United States, and from Tony Young, Senior Public Policy uh, strategist at NISH, and Tony is en route here and will be joining us when he gets here. The full biographies of all the speakers are in your folders along with today's agenda, PowerPoint decks from the presenters, and a point counterpoint article on SSDI that was published recently in the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. One side of that debate is ar argued by Virginia Rito of NASI and Lisa Ekman. The other side was taken by economists Richard Burkhauser and Mary Daly. And you'll also find a blue evaluation form in your packet, and we would really appreciate it if you would fill that out and return it to a NASI staff member before you leave today. And we also encourage you to pick up copies of other NASI resources where, which are available at a table outside the meeting room. So uh, to begin, I'd like to turn to Steve Goss. Steve? <laughs> thanks, Mark, and thanks, Virginia, Pam, uh, for, for setting this up and having the opportunity to come and talk to you all about Social Security Disability Program, which I assume everybody in the room and hopefully who uh, is uh, hearing and seeing this event uh, from el elsewhere knows that Social Security Disability Program now serves almost 9 million disabled worker beneficiaries in our country and another couple of million uh, people who are children and spouse dependents of those disabled workers. Uh, so it's a big program. It serves a lot of people. 
And uh, what, what I can really speak to, probably most effectively and hopefully usefully, is the first of the two questions that are, are raised today. Why more people are claiming or applying for Social Security benefits? Uh, and so let me address that in the context of the projections that we make, uh, working for our board of trustees at, uh, in the administration, uh, working with our advisory board and, and their technical panel and others in developing assumptions and projections into the future of what the cost of Social Security, the retirement system, and the disability system are going to be looking, looking like in the future. Well, first of all, let me flip to a slide. Got to have a picture. Uh, the slide, th there, there are two ways, I think, that we could really address this question of why have we had this run-up in claims and people applying for disability. One is a near-term cyclic phenomenon, which, which relates to the fact that we have had a recent pretty significant recession in this country, as you all know. Uh, the recession resulted in a lot of people becoming unemployed. We went up to a 10% unemployment rate. And uh, when people become unemployed, they seek a way to continue having income. And people who can qualify for our disabled worker benefits, of course, go and apply. So we did have an increase in the number of applications. And we did have an increase in the number of people starting to receive disability benefits. We express this in something we call the dis disabled worker incidence rate. And that's what you see on this chart. It's really just the number of people newly getting disabled worker benefits divided by the number of people who are insured and could get the benefits they apply and qualify. You can see at the time of a recession, we have a run up in the number of people starting to get benefits as happens, but this is a temporary phenomenon from a cyclic economic downturn. And we are projecting that, of course, the number of new disability claimants uh, who become disability beneficiaries while it went up through around 2010 to about a peak will be coming back down and you can see the little red line on here is showing what we were projecting for the number of people starting to get disability benefits had there not been a recession. Well, there was a recession, and that changes everything, and we had a big increase in the number of people coming on the rolls uh, that, that exceeded what we had. A number of these people will be people who might not have ever filed for disability benefits. They might have been able to retain their employment status. Other people are people who might have uh, started to get benefits two or three years later as their uh, personal medically determinable impairment uh, deteriorated further. Uh, but this is really sort of the first effect that we might talk about in terms of an increase in the number of people claiming disability, which is the short-term cyclic effect. A longer-term effect, uh, if we will, really speaks to what Mark uh, mentioned, which is the solvency of the Social Security program. And the longer-term effect for the solvency of the Social Security program does depend on this classic relationship between the numbers of beneficiaries and the number of people paying in, what the tax rates are, what the benefit levels are. And solvency for the Social Security program, we have two different trust funds. We have the Old Agent Survivors Insurance Trust Fund, and separately we have the Disability Insurance Trust Fund. That latter one is the one we're talking about principally today. And on this little chart, you can see we're showing what the trust fund ratios are. The trust fund ratio is just the ratio of the amount of money we have in reserve our trust fund assets, divided by the annual cost of the program. So it's how many years could we pay uh, out of just the reserves that are retained. Uh, and of course, we don't have to pay our benefits out of that because we have continuing income coming in all, all the time. You can see on this projection that for the old age and survivors insurance program in the 2011 trustees report, as Mark mentioned, we're looking to be good out to about 2038. And for the combined old age and survivors insurance, and disability insurance program, if we theoretically put the funds together, uh, we would be good until about 2036 for solvency based on the 2011 trustees report. Also, as Mark mentioned, the disability insurance trust fund, which is a separately legal entity, so we really have to pay attention to that, is projected in our 2011 trustees report to become exhausted, the reserves to become exhausted in 2018. Now, Mark also mentioned the Congressional Budget Office and the President's budget are projecting a somewhat earlier date uh, and you should understand that since the time of our development of the assumptions and the projections for the 2011 trustees report, which was issued last May 13, that's last year, uh, some things happened. We had a run up in inflation early in calendar year 2011. As a result, we ended up having a cost of living adjustment of 3.6% instead of the 0.7 that we had been estimating. The price of gas went up, and we all know what that does to the general price level of everything in our economy. We had almost a 3% higher boost to benefit levels for 2012, and that will persist for years into the future because that COLA stays with people who received it. Uh, at the same time, by the way, in the year 2011, 
the level of average taxable earnings, the earnings that are subject to our payroll taxes, uh, grew by uh, about 1.5% less than we had been projecting. So the combination of a bigger benefit level and a lower earnings level on average resulted in some negative effects for the trust fund. So you can anticipate our upcoming trustees report uh, will probably have a little bit sooner date for trust fund exhaustion for disability than the 2018. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that 2018, 2016 CBO, they're both dates that are quite soon. Uh, and people who do a lot of work in this building and the next two buildings down uh, are paying a lot of attention to this and will surely make changes uh, coming in the not too distant future. The one thing that you might notice on this graph though in the little blue line, which is this trust fund ratio for the disability insurance program in particular, there was a time back around 1994 when it was heading down quite sharply before. And then you can see it bounces uh, after 1994 and it starts heading back up. Well, what actually happened at that time was that the Congress simply enacted something that we refer to as a payroll tax reallocation. They took the total payroll tax, which at that time then and still is, a total of a 12.4% payroll tax. Employers and employees each pay 6.2. That's split between the OASI and DI funds. And they simply reallocated a little bit more of that from the OASI fund to the DI fund. And that more equalized the financial prospects into the future for the OESI and DI funds and cause the DI fund to start going back up again. That's why we've sustained the solvency. And I've got to tell you, right after that was enacted in 1994, our next trustees report that came out projected that trust fund exhaustion for the disability insurance fund would be in the year 2016. So it turned out that that was a pretty good or lucky guess. Take your pick. Uh, so we, so, so this is really, and this speaks to, and let me just mention, this speaks to the, the solvency as we describe it, as, as Mark mentioned, for these programs. And the reason we describe this as the solvency, because solvency in the context of the Social Security programs really just means the ability to pay the scheduled benefits in full in a timely fashion. And in order to do that, we have to have money in the trust funds for one simple reason. By law, the Social Security trust funds do not have the ability to borrow. Much of the rest of the government, if it's in need, if it doesn't have the, the ready cash reserves to pay for things, it can borrow, but the Social Security trust funds cannot do that by law. So we have to have our trust funds above zero. And that's why when we see the numbers dropping uh, as you do out towards 2036 or even earlier for the, uh, for the DI trust fund, that represents a real problem that the Congress absolutely has to address. Should mention though that uh, for the DI fund, under our projections as of the year 2018, assuming nothing were done and we reached trust fund exhaustion, we would still have enough continuing income coming in from taxes that are scheduled in the law at that time to pay fully 86% of the scheduled benefits. So it's not as though the trust fund goes out of business and we don't have any more benefit payments, but we would be 14% short of the funds necessary to pay the full scheduled benefits on a timely basis. Uh, so if we go to our next slide, this gives a little bit different look. Rather than looking at the trust funds and seeing uh, how they look relative to solvency, this next slide gives you a look at what the cost of the OESI and DI, the two social security programs look like as a percent of gross domestic product. Gross domestic product, fancy word, but it's just the total value of all the goods and services that we produce on our shores in this country. And that really represents the ultimate basis for providing everything that we all consume from day to day, including everything that our beneficiaries consume and receive in the form of their benefits. You can see, when you look at this, the lines for the OESI, Old Age and Survivors Insurance, our Retirement and Survivors Insurance Program and Trust Fund, and for the, dis and for the combined Old Age Survivors Insurance and Disability Insurance, that the cost as percentage of GDP, which are what these lines represent, has been pretty constant. Uh, for the combined program, it's been about 4.3% of GDP ever since 1975. Over the next 20 years, it's going to be ramping up what we call a level shift. It's shifting to a higher level and then stabilizing, and the reason for that is something that uh, has been discussed much. Uh, the fact that we had a drop in the birth rates, the baby boom will retire, will be followed by smaller birth rate generations that we expect to persist in the future. And so we have a fundamental shift in the age distribution of our population. Uh, while this will be happening over the next 20 years for our retirement program, you can sort of see in a subtle way on this, for the disability insurance program, it's really already happened. And if we flip to the next slide, uh, you get a better look at it. Uh, this slide shows you uh, the, the fact that the cost of disability insurance 
has already risen uh, from 1975 to 2010. You can see the cost of the program, which is the uh, blue line, has been rising and rising pretty dramatically. You can see the bump right around where we are in history now. Of course, that's because of the recession. Uh, but there's been a general rise up in the cost of the program as a percentage of GDP, and we project that that's going to be essentially stabilizing, maybe even declining ever so slightly going into the future. So uh, the question, of course, for us when we're making our projections is why has this happened and what should we believe will be happening in the future? And for that, we look uh, in our Ways and Means Committee subcommittee uh, staff a while back asked us for a little hearing back in December to address this issue and to look at what the drivers of Social Security disability costs really are. So in regard to that, we looked at it, and one of the first things, of course, one of the first things that comes up is the number of workers we have uh, for each beneficiary. And back when the baby boomers were in the prime working ages, we had a lot of workers for every beneficiary, and that made the cost as a percentage of GDP, cost as a percentage of our taxable payroll, relatively low. But you can see how we are now moving across time into a position of having a much lower ratio of workers per beneficiary. And this is happening and has happened precisely as the baby boomers have moved from where they were 20 years ago, ages 25 to 44, which are ages at which there's not a lot of disability, but people do work, uh, to ages 45 to 64, uh, which is where the baby boomers are essentially now, or in 2010 and 2011. Those are ages at which, which are prime ages for people receiving disability benefits. So let me flip to what we refer to as sort of our, our first cost uh, of, of, of Social Security disability. And beyond those demographic factors, just the aging of the baby boom and being replaced by smaller generations coming behind. The first one of these drivers is just being insured. Being a person of an age where you could receive disability benefits isn't enough to get benefits from our program. You have to actually be insured. There are certain work requirements. And you can see here the percentage of the population, male and female, that is disability insured has been rather constant for men, up around 75%. We project that to stay in the future. But over the last 25 or 30 years, the percentage of women who are disability insured has risen quite dramatically. And the reason for that is because there are certain work requirements, years of work requirements, and there's a recency requirement. You have to have worked essentially five out of the last 10 years. And in the past, women, when they got into their 40s and 50s, many of them did not satisfy that work requirement. Uh, we have moved over the last 25 years to a point where women are essentially at parity with men in terms of satisfying this work requirement. So we've gradually moved up towards women being about as much insured, and we project that will continue into the future. Uh, the other real driver of disability cost is given that you're insured, what's the probability you're actually you know, going to become disabled file for benefits and get the benefits allowed for you. And we can see the blue line here is males, and it bounces around a lot for lots of reasons. Uh, but you can see it's been sort of staying in there at a little bit over five per thousand uh, on, the, on the males. Females, however, if we go back to around the 1990 period, it's been rising quite dramatically. Female disability incidence rates, that is the likelihood of becoming disabled given you're insured, uh, used to be on the order of half uh, or, or a little bit more than half of what male disability incidence rates were, but they also, like the insured rates, have moved up to essential parity with men over time. Uh, both of these factors have, are ones where, the, where women have moved up to parity with men. We don't expect a crossover, so basically this change has occurred, has played out. Uh, we don't expect further changes. Uh, this is an interesting slide you might want to look at later, won't take the time to, to go through it now. This is essentially a slide showing the ups and downs of our uh, disability cost uh, and some of the reasons for it. Recessions, like the most recent one, obviously have a lot to do with this, but there have been a number of changes in the nature of uh, how we define disability. Uh, going a little bit further on these drivers, so the effect of these drivers has resulted in our having disability prevalence rates, which is the percentage of people who are insured that are actually receiving disability benefits. And our disability prevalence rates have been rising for males and females over the last 20 years, and you'll not be surprised to see we're projecting them to be fairly flat in the future, because the drivers we've been talking about, the aging and the baby boom, increasing insured status of females, increasing incidence rates for females, have all really happened. 
uh, already. But you can see for the males, though, where most of these have not really been operating, they're, the male prevalence rates have been rising, too. And that brings us to one more driver that I'd like to put up here to, to show you. One other thing that has been happening in our disability program is that there's been a shift in our disability incidence towards uh, a higher extent of disability incidence at younger ages. It used to be it was mainly people 50 and over, but we've had somewhat of an increase in the number of people at younger ages. And this slide shows you that back in 1980, for both men and women, the disability incidence rate, the probability of becoming disabled, was only about one-fifth, only 20% as large for uh, people at ages 25 to 44 as compared to the incidence rate for people at ages 45 to 64. It was much, much lower. But by 2010, and we project it's going to stay about in the future, that ratio has really changed. Now people at age 25 to 44, instead of only one-fifth, are a little bit closer to one-third as likely. And that's a pretty big change. The shift towards more of our people coming out of the disability roles at younger ages, of course, means that they'll tend to be receiving benefits for a longer period of time, assuming that they don't recover. Uh, and let me just flip to one last little slide. I'll skip over a couple that we have here. But the one last little slide I'd like to just show you is the history and what our projections are for once people start to receive disability benefits, they stop receiving disability benefits. Of course, if they reach retirement age, they are, are transferred over to retirement status. But our, our disabled workers, like everybody else, have a chance of dying, but they also have a chance of recovering. And the recovery rate has been around 1% of people on our disability roles, and we project that it will stay at about that level. So since I am out of time, I will just completely conclude with repeating one slide that you've already seen, showing you what our projections are, and you have now seen the basis for it, that while we've had a rather dramatic rise in the cost of Social Security Disability Insurance Program over the last 20 years, uh, we believe that uh, the components of that increase uh, have basically completed themselves, and we expect the cost as percentage of GDP to be pretty stable into the future. The extent to which changes are necessary, we think, should be looked at in that light. So let me stop there and pass the torch. Thank you, Steve. And next we'll hear from Lisa Ekman of Health and Disability Advocates. Lisa? Good morning. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Steve, for that great presentation. I am going to um, start out by talking a little bit about the importance of the Social Security Disability Insurance Program to people with disabilities. Uh, it is vitally important. It provides critical income support um, for many people with disabilities and their families. In fact, it, it lifts many people out of poverty. Um, almost half of SSDI beneficiaries rely on these critical income benefits for more than 90% of their uh, total income. It is the one thing that keeps many people with disabilities from le leading lives of abject poverty and homelessness. And I want to share just a couple of very brief stories of some people who receive Social Security Disability Insurance benefits, where in both cases it did actually prevent them from being homeless. The first is a man named Henry, and he um, was in his 50s. He had severe cardiac problems, had worked in the insurance industry for a very long time, paid into the, the Social Security system and earned his disability benefits at, until the point at which his heart condition made it no longer healthy for him to work. He applied for benefits, uh, or he stopped working and didn't apply for benefits right away, tried to make a go of it without them, went through his 401k, all of his savings, became homeless, and lived in his car for almost a year before he finally took the step to apply for benefits. And he was able to, after being quickly approved, get an apartment, and his SSDI benefits allowed him to continue to have a home after that. Another story is a woman named Angelise, and she had uh, type 1 diabetes that she developed as a teenager. And she worked for um, many years, and eventually she became um, ill with diabetes-related complications. She actually continued to work when she probably should have stopped working to take care of herself and ended up being hospitalized. While she was in the hospital, she applied for Social Security disability benefits and um, was approved for them. In the meantime, she didn't 
didn't have the kind of savings to rely on that Henry did. Uh, and she had to get help actually from a charity to help her keep her apartment. They paid her rent for her for a couple of months until her benefits did get approved. And then she was able to use her social security disability insurance benefits to help pay for her rent. So the importance of these benefits to people with disabilities and their families cannot be overstated. But why have the roles grown? And I think Steve, did a, uh, Steve Goss did a great job laying this out, but I just want to go over um, a little bit of a recap um, for you. Um, more women qualifying for benefits has led to a big increase. The baby boomers entering their high disability years. The increase in the normal retirement age is something that um, Steve didn't actually mention, but as you all know, the retirement age is going up from 65, it's now 66 for people retiring. For people um, born after 1960, it will be 67. And the way disability benefits work is you get them until you reach your normal retirement age. So for every month that the retirement age goes up, that's another month that benefits come out of the disability trust fund instead of the retirement trust fund. And in 2009, approximately 300,000 300, people received benefits from the disability trust fund that under previous law, would have received benefits from the retirement trust fund. So that does also contribute to the, the increase in cost and the growth in the numbers of people receiving um, disability benefits. As, as Steve said, we've really hit the top of the increase. It's gonna level off and then we'll go down. Um, but there are other factors that do contribute as well. Um, and as, as Steve also mentioned, uh, the economy is one of them. Um, we expect applications and beneficiaries to increase during times of economic downturns. And Steve showed you that chart and you can track when there are recessions, we do see an increase in the number of applications and people who get approved. Employers are less likely to hire and more likely to fire people during times of a, of a weak economy. Um, when, when there are a surplus of workers applying uh, for every job, there, there's a huge focus also on productivity. And when there are perceived concerns over productivity, although all of the research and data show that people with disabilities are no less productive than their non-disabled peers, there still remains a perception among employers and, if, and fear among employers. And so when times are tough, it's even less likely that people with disabilities will get hired. And if they have to let someone go, some of those perceptions around um, the productivity of people with disabilities can lead them to be the first let go. And it, it's harder to find a job if you're laid off, if you're a person with a disability. And that's especially true if you're an older worker with a disability, because now you have two um, potential things that an employer might consider when they're looking at a huge a pool of applicants about who to place in the job that they might look at and view negatively, even though they shouldn't and there aren't any real concerns, the perceptions are enough to, to make employers make different choices. There are a couple other reasons I just want to highlight uh, why the roles have grown over the past couple decades. In the past decade, uh, past couple decades, we have seen a decline in the number of people with health insurance coverage, a decline in employers uh, offering health insurance coverage to workers. If you're a person with a disability, having health insurance coverage is not an option. It is life or death situation. You need to be able to get your treatments. You need to be able to afford your prescription medication. And if, if you can't get health insurance through a job, what people get health insurance through applying for SSDI. They also get access to Medicare. So that's an easy choice. If my choice is death or applying for SSDI benefits, I'm going to apply to get SSDI benefits. Um, there is also a less forgiving workplace. The emphasis on global competition and being competitive and again, the productivity concerns perceived productivity concerns that I discussed just a few moments ago make the workplace less forgiving and people, um, uh, it, it is harder for people who are receiving SSDI benefits to compete in that less forgiving workplace. And most of it I said is based on misperceptions, but whether the, the perception is true or not, if the perception means you don't get hired, it means you don't get a job. The Americans with Disabilities Act has done a, a really fantastic job in helping people with disabilities get the reasonable accommodations they need and be able to sue when they are fired for um, disability discrimination. 
It is also available for discrimination in hiring, but unfortunately, it is extremely hard to prove um, in, in terms of discrimination in hiring, especially if you have a thousand applications for a particular job. It's really hard to prove that. So it, it, there is still discrimination in hiring, and it has not been eliminated by the Americans with Disability Act. Um, and, and to a much lesser extent, but still to some extent, there are other programs that require people to apply for Social Security disability benefits. There are uh, a handful of uh, workers' comp programs that require you to apply for SSDI, and then they offset your workers' compensation um, benefit amount based on the receipt of disability benefits. And the same is true for private disability insurance. That. Um, Many uh, uh, policies will require someone receiving um, private disability insurance benefits to also apply for SSDI, and many of them do have the same kind of offset. So what does this increase mean for the future? Um, as as uh, Steve pointed out, it is leveling off. It's not expected to continue into the future. And it does not mean that the program is not affordable or not sustainable. Sustainability and affordability are both a matter of priorities. In poll after poll, Americans say that they would rather see their taxes for Social Security go up than to see any benefit cuts, and they support doing that. As uh, Steve also mentioned, that we can solve this by just reallocating some of the current taxes in the retirement that go into the retirement trust fund into the disability fund as we have um, done in the past. Obviously, the political situation today is a little different than in 1994, but that's a matter of political will. It is not a matter of it being hard to do. I want to just go over um, the, a few beneficiary characteristics, uh, and that is that people who receive benefits are very diverse. You can see the list of different types of disabilities that people have, and so they some are, are terminal, as, as Steve discussed, and some um, have very debilitating um, disabilities. So when we think about reforming Social Security disability, we have to think, we have to keep in mind this is not a homogeneous group and what works for one person isn't going to work for another person. Every individual is different and their situation is different, their condition is different, the likely track that their condition will take even if they have the same condition is different. It's an, it's an individual situation and we have to keep that in mind. Um, as I mentioned, some um, beneficiaries are terminally ill. About one in five male beneficiaries and one in seven female beneficiaries die within five years of receive, uh, beginning to get benefits. They tend to be older. In um, 2010, the average age was 53. Seven in 10 beneficiaries are over the age of 50, and nearly three in 10 are over the age of 60. And um, many have low educational attainment. Um, two thirds have a high school diploma or less, and almost a third um, did not complete high school. So when we think about um, trying to find work for folks in this changing technology-based, uh, skill-based economy, we have to keep in mind what the characteristics of the people receiving benefits are. So can a significant percentage uh, work and become <clears throat> self-supporting, excuse me? SSDI beneficiaries should be given every service support and encouragement to go to work. But as I've just gone through a lot of the reasons why, it is unlikely that a large percentage uh, are, have the capacity for ongoing work at a significant level. And SSDI does not present a disincentive to work. The benefits are modest. It's an average of $1,110 per month uh, if for in February of 2012. That is um, more than 10% less than a person working full-time at minimum wage. So it is a modest benefit. Does it need reform? SSDI is functioning as it should. It's uh, providing vital wage replacement to millions of people with disabilities and their families who need it. More must be done to help people with disabilities uh, stay at work if they acquire a disability. And more should be done to provide supports and services to SSDI beneficiaries with work capacity to obtain and maintain employment. But that is not the role of an income support program. It's not the role of SSDI, nor should it be. But we should do everything that we can to help people with disabilities work. The employment situation for them is not good, and we should do more. But that is not the role of an income support program that people pay into and earn a benefit through. 
I want to uh, end with some principles for reform, um, that if we think about reform, we ought to really think about these as we evaluate from the perspective of people with disabilities as we evaluate the reform proposals. Any reform should preserve the structure of SSDI program, including the definition of disability. It's, it's appropriate. It's a wage replacement program for people who don't have work capacity. So the definition of disability and the structure of the program are appropriate for that function. Efforts to increase employment opportunities and improve employment outcomes for people with disabilities receiving SSDI should not be achieved through tightening eligibility criteria, narrowing health care benefits, removing the entitlement to benefits, or devolving responsibility to the states. SSDI benefit receipt should not be time limited. We can't predict the course of a person's disability, and so that is what governs whether or not a person can work is what their health condition is and there's no time limit on that and we can't predict it so we shouldn't try to put limits on benefits. Um, and work activities and work preparation activities should be voluntary for SSDI beneficiaries. Um, a person, their family, and their health care providers are in the best position to decide whether or not a work attempt is a healthy thing to do for a person with a disability, not any other arbitrary uh, work limit or work requirement that we would set for them. And we should give the Social Security Administration adequate resources to perform all of the program integrity functions before we, we um, begin reform. We should allow them to have enough resources to complete disability determinations in a timely manner, do continuing disability reviews to ensure that people have continue to have a disability so that the people who are receiving benefits are entitled to them, and we should um, uh, provide them with adequate staff and resources to prevent overpayments to people who do try to work because that is a huge disincentive to people. I have a couple more slides um, talking about the specific reforms, and, um, but I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, I have run out of time, but just want to close by reiterating how important the SSDI program is to people with disabilities. As we think about any type of reforms, we have to remember that these benefits represent the difference between being poor and homeless and, and being able to live independently in the community for millions of people with disabilities and their families. Thank you. Thanks much, Lisa. And uh, next we will turn to Dave Stapleton of Mathematica Policy Research. Thank you, and uh, thanks to NASI for setting this up, and I'm glad to see a great crowd here. This is, this is terrific. Um, so, so far we've heard from Steve that, about the financing and the history of uh, the SSDI program, which I think is the, the issue that's really bringing us here, and, uh, and that you know, things look a little better in the future than they have in the past. And I agree with that. Uh, we've also heard from Lisa that the SSDI program is extremely important for people who are beneficiaries, and I would agree with that as well. But uh, I have fundamental disagreements with Lisa on the issue of the structure of, of the program and it's not just the SSDI program alone, but it needs to be seen in the context of the, uh, the larger disability policy picture. So what, I'm not going to focus on SSDI. We'll talk about it. But I'm going to talk about why I think that the uh, Social Security, I'm sorry, the disability policy in general is failing people with disabilities, and it's also failing taxpayers. And I'm going to brush over fairly quickly a number of ideas for reform. There's just not enough time to look at all of them. Uh, but then I'm also going to close by saying, you know, we're not really not ready for reform and we need to do things in a measured way to, to move the ball forward so that we can be ready for reform. Uh, the, um, let's see, right side, okay. Uh, a lot of my remarks are based on a paper that I wrote with uh, David Mann, who's sitting here in the third row. And uh, there's also an issue brief, which uh, you may have picked up on the way in. It was on the table there. Um, was, the research was sponsored by the National Institute for Disability Rehabilitation Research. So I have to give them credit, but you're not allowed to give them blame. So, uh, so current pe policies are failing people with disabilities. I think exhibit number one is this chart, which has been around and keeps getting updated for many years, that looks at the relative employment rate for people with disabilities, the working age population with disabilities, relative to those without disabilities, their peers, 
Uh, and it goes back to 1981, the first year we had data. And what you can see is there's been this really steady decline in the relative employment rate that started in the late 1990s, uh, where it peaked in 1988 at about um, 38%, and now is down to about 22% in 2010. Okay? And um, along with that relative decline has been a decline in the relative household incomes of people with disabilities. And uh, here, uh, the situation is a little better, and income support plays a very big part in why it's better. But there has been a decline from a peak of about 64% uh, to about 52% today. <coughs> so uh, the other really important set of information about how current policies are failing people with disabilities concerns poverty rates for people with disabilities. So my colleague, Gina Livermore, and former colleague, Pei Yun Shi, uh, did a recent study looking at the long people who are in long-term poverty. So that's people whose household incomes are below uh, the federal poverty line for at least three years in a row out of four. And uh, they found that 65% of those people who are in long-term poverty have a significant disability of some sort. Uh, we've also done work, and again, Gina Livermore has been doing this uh, using Social Security, a survey that we did for Social Security of their beneficiary population. Uh, and we found in that survey, and this was from, I believe, 2005 or 2000, yeah, 2005, that 50% of all SSDI and SSI recipients combined, working age recipients, uh, lived in households whose incomes were below the poverty line. Uh, now, if we just looked at SSI, it's 70%. Uh, SSDI only, those just on SSDI, it's, it's more like 30%. But that's a very high poverty rate relative to the overall population. Uh, there's also been a body of research that's not on this slide about the hardships that people with disabilities who live in impoverished households experience. And they experience hardships such as not going out without food, uh, not being able to get medicine they need and that sort of thing, much more frequently than people without disabilities who live in, in poverty uh, you know, with the same level of income. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think, uh, you know, going back, I, I think this is enough of a reason to consider disability policy broadly and whether or not needs re it needs restructuring. Uh, but the thing that's really driving interest in disability policy isn't these factors, which I think they should be, uh, they've been around for a long time, and we've known about them for a long, a long time. But it's the, it's the fiscal situation. Uh, it's the perception that current policies are failing taxpayers. And so now we're going to look at the SSDI program quickly, and these numbers are going to be consistent with what Steve told you earlier. Uh, this, this chart just shows you the number of beneficiaries on the rolls, the working age population on SSDI, starting with 1970 rate right through 2010. And I want to focus attention for a minute on 1980 and the period after 1980. So 1980 and 81 was the last time that both Congress and the administration were so concerned about growth and expenditures for this program, the number of people on the rolls, that there were significant cuts in eligibility. And uh, you can see that f after 1980, there was actually a significant drop in the number of people on the rolls. This happened during the worst recession that we had had since the Great Depression up to that point. And it's still the worst recession except for the recent one. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, there was such a political backlash that uh, Congress in 1984 enacted amendments to the uh, Social Security Act, which, uh, which basically reversed uh, what had happened in, earlier in, in the decade. And, um, and some people would say it, it more than reversed. That's very difficult to determine. But, um, uh, the growth in the roles was pretty moderate after that period, but we had a pretty strong economy up until 1990. And what you can see is that starting in 1990, there's this acceleration of growth in the number of people on the rolls, and that growth has continued pretty solidly ever since then for the last three decades. Now, of course, as Steve explained, a lot of that growth has to do with growth in the number of people who are disability insured, especially among women, and it also has to do with uh, the aging of the baby boom population, my, my generation. And uh, so we're, you know, we're more prone to disability than we were when we were younger, unfortunately. But uh, uh, I've, we did some calculations to show you what the effects of those factors are. So that's what this red line is showing you. And we anchored this red line in 1980. So what it shows you is how the number of people on the rolls would have grown 
if the, uh, if the prevalence rates for those who are disability insured, uh, qualified for the program, the prevalence of those who are actually on the program within the age sex categories stayed the same as they were in 1980. And what you can see here is that the, there would have been overall growth and it would have been substantial over the per years since 1980 in the next three decades, but not nearly as large as we have seen the growth be since uh, the early 1990s. And in fact, uh, the difference between the values in 2010 is 20, uh, 28% or 2.2 million beneficiaries. So if we roll back to the clock to the prevalence rates for 1980, uh, we'd have 2.2 million fewer people on the rolls. That amounts to uh, over $50 billion in benefits if you count both the SSDI benefits and the Medicare benefits that these people are eligible for. So that's a big, that's a big number. But it turns out that the Medicare benefits and the SSDI benefits received by SSDI beneficiaries is less than half of what the federal government spends for uh, people with disabilities um, currently. And uh, these numbers are from a uh, paper that Gina Livermore and I did uh, that was published uh, last year, last year uh, where we tried to do an accounting of all the money that the federal government spends to support the working age population with disabilities. And I won't go into, the, have, don't have time to look at the details, but the bottom line for fiscal year 2008, which was the last year we had complete data for, was $357 billion. Uh, and uh, that was growth after inflation adjusted of 30.6% uh, since uh, we did the exercise for uh, fiscal year 2002 as well, so just over a, a six-year period. The total amounts to 12% of all federal outlays in that year. The SSDI and Medicare piece is only a little over 5%. Uh, so along with, with those programs, we have Medicaid, we have SSI, of course. Uh, we have veterans benefits are uh, a, a large and growing number. But there are also lots of other uh, little programs that, that contribute to these totals. Uh, so, so uh, I think that this, the fiscal issue, the overall fiscal issue with the, uh, the federal budget is going to drive attention to these programs because they represent such a large share when you look at them together of all federal outlays. And uh, it's going to be very difficult to protect these programs in the way they are. And that's probably going to drive more than the issues that I raised first, uh, the policy debate about uh, what we should do with disability policy. Now, in the past, we've tried a lot of incremental things to improve disability policy, improve employment specifically for people with disabilities, uh, and the evidence shows that they have not been successful. There was the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, the, the Rehab Act, and, which is now part of the Workforce Investment Act. Uh, there have been important reforms with that, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and then the 1999 Ticket to Work and Work Incentives Improvement Act, which had a number of different provisions specifically for SSDI and SSI uh, to, to increase employment. And, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, they just haven't paid off in the way that we expect, we hope that they would, uh, and some of them expected it would. So why is that the case? Well, there are lots of very specific reasons, but I think there are a couple of fundamental problems. One is that we're layering complexity on top of complexity. I think everybody will agree that current programs for people with disabilities are enormously complex. And uh, we worked on the ticket to work evaluation and, and, you know, the ticket concept is very simple, but when you overlay it over these very complicated programs, it became very difficult for the Social Security Administration to administer. Uh, and the other thing is that we still are stuck with what we call a benefits first, work later approach. In order to get most benefits supported by the federal government, you have to get on SSI or SSDI first. And, uh, and that sort of drives everybody towards those as the programs for first support when, uh, when they run into trouble, uh, such as in a recent recession. So there have been many proposals for reforms. A number of them concern what are called early, inter early intervention for workers. On this slide, um, the Social Security Advisory Board, as early as 1996, wrote a report about pursuing these ideas. There's more specific proposals, uh, the work insurance uh, program that's called Being American was uh, Brian McDonald and people in, in the West Coast. Uh, it, it's a public program. It's a new social insurance program to ensure that people can stay at work. Um, very recently, David Otter and Mark Duggan proposed what I call universal short-term private disability insurance paid partly by employers, partly by ind individuals. 
uh, but it would be required, and, and uh, the idea is to give the employers and the individuals more of a stake in staying in the labor force. Uh, Rich Burkhauser and Mary Daly have been proponents of uh, doing experience rating with the uh, disability share of the Social Security, of the trust, I'm sorry, of the payroll taxes, uh, which you know, most other social insurances are uh, experience rated, not Medicare, but certainly uh, unemployment insurance and, and workers' compensation. Uh, we've talked more about more fundamental pro reforms, and I think there are a lot of people that would say those early intervention approaches, they are interesting and probably should be looked at more, but they're not going to be enough to really reverse the trends that we see historically for the well-being of people with disabilities. So uh, David Mann and I have looked at some of these, uh, addressing work in disincentives more comp comprehensively. One idea is to replace the inability to work criterion for Social Security benefits with a work capacity approach to determining eligibility. So you look at the work capacity of the individual first, and it's only when it's clear that you can't uh, tap into that capacity, help the person be more self-sufficient, that you give them the long-term benefits. Uh, the idea of changing the compensation principle from wage replacement to uh, the uh, uh, extra cost of disability is one that has some uh, place in Europe already. We've never done that in the United States, but is an interesting idea. Uh, there's been a lot of interest from the General uh, Accountability, Government Accountability Office, and we've picked up on this in Man and Stapleton about integrating or consolidating programs. Uh, we, you know, one of the fundamental problems is, is the fact that programs are so fragmented. Uh, there's also the idea of devolving more responsibility to states or localities. I think there's a lot of people who are very worried about that because uh, they don't trust states' governments to do the right thing, and they think of the pre-SSI, federal SSI days. Uh, that's something that's been proposed by Rich Burkhauser and Mary Daly. We've also took a, taken a look at this, and we want to. We think it's important to consider other options in devolving to the states. But it just seems incredibly important since uh, local people are going to be delivering service to people with disabilities that you give them some flexibility as well as responsibility to uh, uh, to to administer benefits, but also have a very strong oversight capacity. Um, but I think one thing we can all agree on is that all of the structural changes proposed, they're not ready to go. We don't know, we can't roll them out the way they are. Now, it would be incredibly irresponsible to do that. Uh, they, they could end up costing more than our current programs, but more problematically, they could really harm people with disabilities because we just don't know enough about what we're doing. What we think we need is a long-term program, at least 10 years, to start pursuing some of these ideas uh, try to build the evidence base, build a political consensus, and, and develop policy reforms. Uh, that requires an enormous amount of demonstration work and research work. It's got to be collaborative. There's many federal agencies that have to be involved, in it, and as well as state and local agencies and private uh, organizations as well. And in order to do that, you really need legislation that would promote that. So just to, uh, to close, it seems to me that we really have sort of two viable options. Uh, and one is we can continue with the current programs the way they are. But given the country's fiscal situation, <coughs> I think that that means trimming eligibility and benefits in the decades moving forward. We can probably eke small efficiency gains out of the individual programs. But uh, I think the bottom line is going to be further deterioration in the economic security of people with disabilities. The alternative is to let's launch a long-term structural reform process where we do the groundwork to build the evidence base so that we can move forward. And maybe that would buy us a little more time to, to try to preserve the, uh, the existing programs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next, we're going to hear two brief uh, responses to the presentations. And following that, we'll be moving into Q&A. So we've structured the morning to have plenty of time for your questions and for a conversation with our panel. So uh, be thinking about your questions. Uh, our first response will come from Marty Ford, Director of the Public Policy Office at the Ark of the United States. Marty. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here today. And I'll move quickly because I know we have a certain amount of time. I did find Steve Goss's information very helpful uh, in describing exactly what is happening in the programs. And I want to say that I agree with Lisa Ekman's principles on reform. I thought they were very uh, useful and, and absolutely on target. 
I do want to comment a little bit on David Stapleton's proposal. I'm sure you're not surprised, David. Um, and go into a little bit of what was not covered in the slides, but in more detail in um, his written proposal. Uh, David has actually proposed uh, that there be a program that includes a disability allowance um, that, as I read it, would be a bit less than what is currently an income benefit under current law. And my question is, since the benefits under current law are already so uh, low, what in the world are beneficiaries are intended to live on? How are they going to cover their basic income needs for food and shelter? It's also, the program also seems to call for reducing these benefits and spending them in another way, not necessarily for food and shelter, and uh, serving more people in the same program. And I have very, very serious concerns about what this means. Um, the the um, proposal does not seem to guarantee health insurance, uh, except for people in one category out of three categories. It's very unclear where the money would come from for the other folks to purchase their own insurance on the open market. And when you're talking about people who are al already very financially vulnerable uh, and there are questions of affordability, uh, I think that's a, a big issue. One of the proposals is that there would be a group of people who are deemed to be, uh, deemed to have low work capacity, and from my perspective, I think this would be limiting and labeling people in a way that is not um, productive. I think many people do try to work, and I think the SSI program shows us that even with limited work history uh, and what many people might think of as low work capacity, people do attempt to work, and they are successful at it and in supplementing their benefits. Uh, and I would not want to see something that would discourage that or in some way prevent people from trying to improve the, um, the situation that they are in. And frankly, I don't see the advantages of creating three new categories. What I do see in terms of um, evaluating people, putting them in three categories, uh, is a whole new administrative process it would cost new monies. I can see all the appeals that, that are associated with that if you don't like the category you were put into and the administrative costs that would go with that. To what end, I'm not sure. So those are my reactions to the sort of the deeper uh, end of that um, proposal. But I want to take this opportunity to make a few comments of my own. I think it's important to remember that um, the basic purpose of SSI and SSDI uh, is income support for those who are experiencing significant limitations in their ability to work due to disability. The intention is to replace income to provide food and shelter. It may be temporary, it may be permanent. The programs, um, particularly uh, work incentives, have evolved over time as Congress has attempted to address its own evolving understanding of disability and the nature of work and supports. And people who depend on these programs are in a very financially vulnerable situation. They need the cash support. They need health care. They cannot necessarily handle major swings in policy decisions or in cash flow or health care eligibility. On the other hand, attempts to improve the program, uh, Congress has been faced with issues of cost estimates. This is a huge program. Every time there's a new and great idea, and believe me, I think we've proposed lots of great ideas, um, the changes have had to be incremental because the cost geared to um, addressing um, any of the pieces of the program are so huge. Unintended consequences are that um, things just cannot be done um, in a big way. And often we end up with layered complexity, and that I do agree with you, David. There are layered um, complex complexities in the program. We did attempt when the, the um, Section 1619 program was made permanent in the SSI program, we did attempt to have that um, added to the Title II program, and uh, we're not able to do it then. In the days of working on the early um, uh, part of the Senator Jeffords bill, actually, uh, in his version of the, what became the Ticket to Work bill, there were provisions in there to, to do that. It ended up being a demonstration program of the dollar for two dollar offset and also the um, 
the um, Medicare eligibility, um, permanent Medicare um, eligibility was part of that. Um, it is time to look at that again, and in fact, in the President's budget for this year, there is a request to look at the proposal for work incentive simplification pilot. And that would um, include some of those elements of continued attachment to Medicare and simplification of the on and off and the removal of the penalties and ultimately could join up again with that two-for-one offset that is currently being tested. These things have worked in the SSI program. We need to see it work in the Title II program. We know that they work. They are incremental and people with disabilities have been asking for them for now decades, and I believe that it's time to see these things um, be put into operation. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. And now we will hear from Tony Young, who is Senior Public Policy Strategist at NISH, which is a large um, national community-based organization doing advocacy on behalf of disabled individuals. Tony? I'm just getting turned on the front. At the top. Right. Okay. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me back there? Okay, good. Um, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity to, to speak to you this morning about DI and work incentives and going back to work. So certainly a subject that's been close to my life for the 41 years I've been a quadriplegic. It's been widely credited to Mark Twain that when asked about uh, lies, that there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. Which is to say that although numbers don't always lie, they don't always tell the full story. Behind each of those numbers is a human being trying to maximize their potential. Now, maximize potential has a lot of different meanings. For some people, it means uh, trying to be the CEO of IBM or the executive director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. For other people, it means just uh, getting by, managing complex uh, medical conditions, keeping your family together, keeping a house over your, or a roof over your head, and uh, daily activities of that sort. The, um, even the GAO, in their research, has found that people with disabilities face multiple barriers uh, to employment, including a lack of education, lack of skills, lack of training, uh, barriers uh, at the workplace, no reasonable accommodations, um, and, uh, of course, discrimination, which we've heard about before. I want to go give two quick examples of how this works. First example, you have a person with cerebral palsy who has a speech impairment, uses a, a wheelchair and a speech board, has an advanced degree in, uh, in economics. If that person were to be, um, were to lose either the wheelchair or the speech board, or was it available of an opportunity to get that advanced degree, odds are they won't be able to work. That's the thin line. A second person, a person with quadriplegia at the C4 level, uh, uses a power wheelchair, which probably costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000, uh, uses a, a, uh, an adapted van, uh, which will cost about 22,000 base and another 10 or 15,000 for accommodations. Uses personal assistant services at the workplace and at home, which will throw an additional 15 or 20,000 dollars annually into the into the cost. And you can see that if any of those uh, tools uh, or supports are withdrawn, the person is not going to be able to work and is going to be, in fact, uh, on the disability rolls um, until, something, until that could be um, rectified. Um, 
Dave Stapleton has proposed major structural reforms, uh, including early intervention, comprehensive disincentives reform, uh, program consolidation, and, and more state control. I'm going to concede the point that the system must improve to facilitate work. But I want to put out two uh, basic principles of uh, my own, and uh, I think they're pretty widely shared by the disability community. First principle being that reform begins with do no harm. Uh, we don't want anyone to be more disadvantaged uh, after reforms than they were before the reforms started. Um, secondly, the uh, disability community point of view is that it's not too easy to get on SSDI. It's too hard to exit from SSDI. Um, as Marty said, the disability community itself has been very active over the last 20 or 30 years in trying to make uh, changes to help people go to work, to get the supports they need, the training, the education. So the question is, which problem are we trying to solve right now? Um, we see that the conflicting confusions can be drawn from the data. When I looked at it, I was uh, not able to definitively tell if the, if the DI roles were growing or if they're going to be stable in the future. That's an important question. Another question, should our incremental ideas that were previously not adopted be tried again? Should it be expected that systemic change succeed now when it didn't succeed before? And is it possible to impose new taxes on employers and employees in order to fund some of the ideas that are, that are, um, that are being floated? These, these ideas, especially the ones addressed at uh, disincentives reform, I think are, are the way to go. Um, incremental, I believe, is the way to go, simply because we're not going to be able to, to uh, convince the Congress that massive changes are appropriate at this time. Um, again, if the, uh, if the economy turns around, certainly that will, will help. But without these incremental changes, the, uh, especially to the work incentives, uh, the problem is not going to be uh, resolved. Thank you very much.